Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I mean, I think it's been a really great workshop so far. I'm learning a lot, um, and I think it's really timely, actually. Um, and so, like Valerie said, I'm going to start talking about where we're working from the molecules up to the population. And basically, uh, where my research fits, it, fits in is I scale the sublethal effects of contaminants and stressors to fish population dynamics. I'm using a number of different techniques. Um, as I, in, when I introduced myself, I, um, I said I have a diverse background. I have physiology and behavior, toxicology and ecological modeling, life history theory. And basically what my research does is tries to glue those all together um, in using modeling. <laughs> I just had to do that. I, had to, I, li I like that figure, <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> and so a lot of my, um, my research, so I, it really falls into three main themes, uh, scaling the sublethal effects of stressors to population or community effects, determining how these life history variations and the physiological processes mediate responses to stressors, and assessing the effects of multiple stressors on individual fish populations and communities. And when I, when I, when I set up this, my interest in being the glue between these different disciplines and, and these types of uh, research questions, the adverse outcome pathway framework seems to make a lot of sense for, for this type of research that I do. Okay. And I, I don't stick with just contaminants. I try to use this sort of this, this, this adverse outcome pathway framework, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a few slides for those that aren't familiar with it. But I, 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 it's, it started with the contaminant field, but I also use a, do a, a look at a number, number of different types of stressors, such as sea lamprey parasitism, biological toxins, food limitations, and hypoxia as well. And I try to put it within this type of framework. Okay. And I thought I would introduce this, this slide. I know this is an old one, but it comes from Marshall Adams, who was at Oak Ridge. And you know, it's kind of, an inf it's, it's kind of what sums up the problem in toxicology in a, in a really way, in a, in a great way, and I keep using it over and over, and I know, but I, I think it's a really effective um, figure. Basically, if you can think of um, uh, scaling, it's a scaling issue. For example, on, on this one axis here, we have a temporal scale from moving from minutes, days, months, years, to generations, and you can also imagine putting like a, um, a biological organization scale on it as well, going from cell, organ, organism, population, and community, and you're moving up these levels of um, scale, um, essentially we know that response sensitivity to things, to stressors, are, are really high at the, at the cell level and they really drop down as you go into the things that are, into the years and generations, things that have high ecological relevance, right? Um, basically we've been, we're really good at measuring things here, but we have trouble predicting things here and that's what the whole, the whole idea of this um, this adverse outcome pathway thing come, comes about. Um, and basically what happened in uh, 2007 is the National Research Council came up with this, this, this document was, which is kind of suggesting that we were doing toxicology completely wrong. There has to be a paradigm shift. Um, basically uh, go from systems based on whole animal testings to one founded primarily on in vitro methods, wanting a new toxicity s testing system that evaluates these biological significant perturbations and key toxicity uh, pathways using computational biology, comprehensive array of high throughput in vitro tests with cells and tissues to sort of accomplish this. Um, and it's be it just, it basically because of the scope of the problem, we have thousands and thousands of chemicals and thousands of species as well, right? But this, is, this was based on the human health idea. And then in 2009, a Pelston workshop was um, put together to, to try to take these ideas that were put in the NRC 2007 document to try to move it to the toxicology realm. Um, and basically, as a result of this, this Pelston workshop, there's two t challenges that impede ecotoxicology's transition to this 21st century paradigm in ecological risk assessment. One is the linkage. We have to establish these credible links between the responses measured at the cell or tissue level and adverse outcomes measured at the whole animal or population. And extrapolation, we have to develop these biological based quantitative extrapolation tools or models that allow us to apply cell or tissue level data to individuals or individual level data to entire populations. So that's, those are the big challenges that impede this um, for tox testing. And so that's kind of where, where a lot of my research is focused on and is in these areas right here. Okay. 
And as, and the Pelson group, I was part of work group three, and then Julian, Julianne is here, and Matt was part of it too. There's, we have all these people sitting around the table discussing it. <laughs> and Julianne came, um, presented one of the, one of the figures that came out of that paper. This is, and basically, how do we take all the cell and tissue stuff and move it to the population, using the individual as sort of the anchor that bridges the two areas. Okay. Um, so, what is an adverse outcome pathway? I, I know. And some, sometimes when I give these talks, everybody knows what they are, and sometimes they don't. So I'm just going to give a little brief introduction. They're sort of conceptual representations of these key events that span multiple levels of biological organizations. They link these molecular initiative events to adverse outcomes. Basically, so that's this adverse outcome pathway terminology. There's key events, molecular initiative events. That's a lot of jargon, really, if you think about it in some ways. But really what it is is it's, it's a scaling problem with defined outcomes is essentially what it is. And so I, Valerie put up this, this, this picture um, uh, yesterday, and I just want to go through it a little bit in, in a little bit more detail. So basically what it is is you're, you have a toxicant that um, has some sort of macromolecular interaction. So there's receptor ligand, DNA binding, protein oxidation. Then, then basically you move up levels of biological organization to cellular responses, gene activation, altered signaling, protein depletion, organ responses. Um, physiology, et cetera, hormone levels, and then individual responses, um, for example, lethality, impaired development, impaired reproduction, cancer, and I put behavior in red because it's often left off of this thing, so, and then up, up to the population. And so basically what, what you're trying to do is you're, you have something in your, and, then, and there's a lot of complicated stuff that's happening here to move up to this level, but in the adverse outcome pathway thing, they. You don't need to know everything. You just have to link it to something at this level that then can be translated up higher levels of, in, of biological interaction, of, of biological organization. So basically, you need an anchor one, which is a molecular initiating event. You need that. And then you need to anchor it somewhere at the individual or the population level right here. Okay. All of these things that we have in all these boxes right here, we have the molecular initiating event right here, but all of these boxes, we call them key events, okay? Um, and then there's some things that are, and so one of the things that I, um, responding to Valerie's talk yesterday, is it's, it's, it's restricted to this molecular uh, inter initiating events to this popul to up to right here. They c you can maybe get to like a change in lambda, which is a population response, or you can get changes in uh, recruitment, things like that. But it's kind of restricted to this framework at the present moment because there's things that are um, affecting it. For example, it's kind of got this sort of this nebulous cap at this level, the, the chemical properties here. Because these are, for example, if you think of um, at this end, you can have um, absorption, distrib distribution, meta metabolism, and excretion, all those different types of chemical properties that can in interact with this molecular, in, in, um, molecular initiating event. And that can be really situation specific and very hard to put into something like a framework like this. Um, and then if you think about what's happening at this end too, we can get it to the lambda part, but at the community structure part then, there's all this complicated, each community is a little different. There's a, spe there's a situation specific community that's kind of restricting it there. So there's another, there's like two sort of caps on the end of this um, adverse outcome pathway that are hard to define because they're situation specific. And, and granted, I mean, we still have a long way to, to get all these linkages in here, so, but, but I think that's why it's, it's stuck within this framework right now. So the challenge is, is to try to, to convert some of these things into something that can go into those community models and, and things like that. So anyway. Okay, so and if you're interested in how to construct um, adverse outcome pathways, um, there's a document by the OECD, and I put that up as, as as alternate reading, okay? So they have all this terminology in there. And if you're interested in this information any further, I put that up there. Um, and also what's really interesting that's just come up and it's building is this adverse outcome pathway wiki, okay? Um, <laughs> and so what it is is this wiki that they're putting together. They're trying to capture all the adverse outcome pathways that are out there. So everybody is contributing all their data to, to this type of um, wiki. So as Valerie mentioned before, the, the adverse outcome pathway is pretty linear at the moment, right? Um, and it has to be sort of, 
in the beginning because that's something that people can grasp hold of at the moment. It's tractable, right? Um, and so people put their adverse outcome pathways with one particular molecular initiating event to one key event. But they can put all, I mean, so you might have uh, one molecular initiating event that goes to several key events, but those become separate en entries into this wiki. And eventually they hope that they all can kind of combine and then you can see all these like branching, branching nodes and stuff for, for these, uh, um, that's what they want to do. So anyway, it's kind of, it just went through beta testing, I believe, and Stephen Edwards with the EPA is, is a big part of this. And so, um, so it's something to worth, worth, worth checking into if you want. So it's, they're trying to put all together, all the information together on this as possible. So it, it's called the Adverse Outcome Pathway Knowledge Base, right? So right now, and Valerie is right, there's not a lot of quantitative links between these, these, these uh, nodes, these key events. So basically when they want to try to get all the information together and then move into something called Effectopedia, <laughs> all right, <laughs> which then starts to, Effectopedia will identify exactly where special knowledge is needed to quantitatively link these biological effects and aid specialists in creating a larger context for their research, okay? So it's starting to try to put together and start to, to ask for these quantitative linkages between these, these particular key events, okay? Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm not part of this, but I was part of this workshop, so I thought I would introduce this because um, basically right now we have the, the AOP. I mean, I'm I'm, there's really a really good, well-defined one with fish vitalinogenesis, but there's a lot of them that are not not quite so well-defined. And, and so it's great if every, what, what the beauty about this adverse outcome pathway framework is, is that all biologists, regardless of their discipline, can see where they can fit in, you know, and they can start to put their data in um, and then, and hopefully over time, you start to get these, moving it towards more quantitative linkages. Right, so what I do though is I try to create some of these quantitative linkages between these key events. Um, I've been focusing on two main AOPs and I work from the middle. So, so sometimes you think it's a linear, so you have to start at the molecular initiating event or you have to start at the population. But I actually kind of start somewhere in the middle and then I move out, okay, and then I put up a paper um, as well as alternative reading that of another, they did a swim bladder function. They, they, they start that way too. They move from the middle out, and sometimes that's the, the most easiest way to work with these things. Um, and I've been looking at the behavior of larval fish and reproductive hormones of adult females as molecular initiating events, I mean as uh, AOPs. All right, um, so just a little bit of background um, behavior. I'll just introduce what we've done to do some of these um, these quantitative linkages between key events. And with behavior, we're linking behavior to population level um, outcomes, and then as well as uh, uh, reproduction, we're linking it to population relevant outcomes as well. And then, and then we're, that's what I started with, and then we've been trying to move downwards, down upstream, you know, to try to go to the molecular initiating, initiating events. Sorry, there's a lot of terminology with these. <laughs> All right, so behavior, it's, it's used as a toxicological endpoint a lot of times because it's, and it's really powerful. It's an integration of its physiological response to its environment internally and externally, how it's responding. Um, and then we have lots of, there's been lots of effects on contaminants, of, of contaminants on fish behavior. Um, lots of studies, but they're often really subtle or sublethal, which makes that a little bit challenging to link that. What, is, what does a change in swimming speed mean to a whole population of fish, for example? <coughs> and so basically what we've done in the past, and this is what I did with part of my dissertation with Kenny Rose, is we used some, uh, we used laboratory results and we looked at the contaminant effects on survival skills of larval fish use statistical models and individual based models and matrix population models to make those, those linkages. So for example, like you can see here, this is just some actual data from the laboratory with mercury. Uh, if they're just kept in petri dishes, it does, we have control low dose high mercury. There's absolutely no effect on growth, um, which makes sense. They're kind of in a nice ideal environment, no predators, no, no, no food limitation. But what happens is, um, you, you see as they, as they start to mature at, at days three after hatching and days 11 after hatching when they absorb their yolk, when yolk sac or their oil droplet, I guess their, um, the mercury is released and you see a decrease in swimming speed. Okay. Also you see some really subtle, subtle effect, really variable but very subtle effects on visual reactive distance. So that means, so like you put these little uh, uh, 
larval fish in petri dishes and you put a pendulum with a fake predator and you respond see when they start to respond or they're they're afraid right and that's kind of there's a really variable data but we just took this whole data set that whole data structure and we put it into an individual based model okay so um so basically i'm sure many of you are familiar with individual based models I, yeah i'm pretty sure um basically you know you have a, a larval fish cohort that's moving through it's looping over Larvae and it's countering zooplankton. That's things, things uh, where swimming speed can play a role. Um, uh, it either grows or starves, and it can be encountered and captured by predators. And that's where those those uh, data like swimming speed and probability of escaping a fish predator can play a role. Um, it's just this virtual ecosystem with uh, appropriate prey items and predators in in the actual system, and you loop over each larvae each day until they've all sort of died or they've moved on to the next stage. And then basically from that, you can get uh, data or simulation results that, that suggest uh, that, that, are, that are translatable to uh, population level like outcomes. Like for example, so here's a control, they, the control cohort, for example, with they have a 1% survival, whereas if you have that low dose mercury with impairments in swimming speed and predator avoidance, it drops the survival right down as does, as does the um, high doses. And same, they, they take a lot longer to get through that, that, that stage as well. They take a lot longer to grow, okay? And so these are things that can, these are, these are endpoints that can easily be picked up by population models. Some simple calculations into matrix models or whatever, or even into other individual-based models, okay? So you can take these subtle behavioral effects to stage survival and duration can be applied to these matrix population models to long-term dynamics. Basically, what it's really cool, what's really cool about it is it takes these, it, this, these endpoints like stage survival and uh, duration are, uh, allows you to compare d across different larval fish species. It allows you to compare across different behaviors and it puts it into this common currency, all right? So, I mean, because uh, contaminants might have different uh, behavioral effects. Um, but when you convert it into something like this, then you are able to compare between contaminants and between species as well. Okay, okay so then that's the behavior one, and I'm just going to introduce the reproduction one because uh, um, that's the other uh, AOP that we've been working on. Um, basically looking at the changes in hormonal dynamics because it's often measured as an indicator of endocrine disruption. So you want to translate these subtle changes in in hormone levels into endpoints that be, can, can be interpreted at the population level, such as egg production. Um, and so we have a really simple, phys we, we built a really simple physiological model. Um, Irv's gonna go, he's got a, a much much better parameterized uh, lake, uh, trout model that he's gonna talk about after this. So I won't talk about too much detail here. But basically what we do is relate these uh, physiological biomarkers to viable oocytes using a ser series of ordinary differential equations, right? So you, from the pituitary, you have gonad gonadotropins that are released, they act on the ovary, uh, stimulate testosterone, which is converted to estradiol, act on the estrogen receptor, produce vitiligenin. Okay, now vitiligenin is egg yolk protein, and that can be translated into the number of potential viable oocytes that are at the, the, and then, then this is something that the population model can pick up, like egg production, right? And I think uh, David Miller has done some really nice work with converting the vitiligenin to, to, to egg production um, as well. And so anyway, this is kind of just the model in a, a little bit more of a... I didn't put equations up, sorry, <laughs> but I just put these... This is just as a box form, okay? So you have the gonadotropin that's driving estradiol. We have steroid binding proteins and some dynamics. and. And the output here is vitiligenin production. And um, what you can get from it, for example, and we did a hypoxia simulation, whereas you put the, the impairments in these, in these parameters, you just put them into the model. Um, and what you see, for example, this is vitiligenin over months here. And what we see is that uh, we see a 61%, in the model out simulation, we saw a 61% reduction in vitiligenin when they've been exposed to, hypo to low dissolved oxygen. And in the lab, it was comparable. They had a 62% decrease in fecundity. So that's kind of where we're, we're going with this. Um, or estrogen receptor as well. Um, and anyway, so this is just to show the compare the, the lab results with the model output. And it seemed to work fairly well for a very simple model. 
So, anyway. All right, so this physiological model, we created this dynamic model of vitellogenesis in fish. It was linked to fecundity. And so you can simulate endocrine disruption in a number of different ways, like alter the coefficients, have multiple action sites on certain mechanisms. And it really plates, places these static biomarkers in the context of a dynamic system. Because if you think about when you're measuring hormone levels, you're, it's a snapshot in time, right? So you can measure it and put it in within some sort of dynamic system that's a little bit more um, formative. So then we took, this is, so those were the two AOPs that we started working on. And so then we wanted to, to take those because we were trying to make the linkages, the quantitative linkages between uh, egg production and behavior to population relevant endpoints. So we wanted to now start to, to go backwards. <laughs> All right, and this is what the focus of this Great Lakes Restoration Initiative grant was. I'm working with this with Neil Basu, Michael Caravan, Rick Getz, and Jessica Head. Um, and basically we have these two AOPs that we're working on. Um, the top one again is this neurobehavior one, and here we have a reproduction one right here. Um, basically, so we have mercury, we're using mercury as the stressor. Um, it interacts with these neuroendocrine receptors and enzymes. We're looking at cellular responses, then organ responses, and then individual responses, and then we, we link those up to the population. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about this, this top one right here. So we're taking, we have the impaired behavior sort of assays worked out and, and this linkage here. And so now we're trying to move backwards and get some of these to link in to this. All right. Um, and this is part of Francisco Mora's PhD project where um, he's taking gene expression data and linking it to behavior. And we're looking on two different species. We have the perch and the zebrafish. Um, and basically, we're using the zebrafish mostly because more is well known about the zebrafish than the perch. It's a, a good model species. We're using that to try to inform some of the gene, um, gene expression patterns that we would see in the perch. Okay. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. So he, he's, um, it, it's still coming along. So, um, but basically, we, he took these five days post-fertilized um, zebrafish embryos. Um, they'd been exposed to, to mercury for in, in this generation and then these this generation was exposed to mer um, mercury and we just collected over several generations to get this generation right here and then we're working on this generation to do the deep sequencing and behavioral assays um, and um, he collected things like hatching yield locomotor activity and the light and dark assays that is used um, in some regulatory agencies, spontaneous swimming, we looked at the rate of travel, average, max, min velocities, percent active, inactive, foraging, he's looking at the efficiency of how well they're eating, the number of foraging attempts per unit of time, and proportion of successful fish versus unsuccessful. Um, and what's really interesting about this is so we're, we're, we think that we, zebrafish can inform the perch, and we find that at the behavior level, they do completely different things. Okay, so here's just an example. This is the assay, the light dark assay. Um, so we have larval perch. Um, so you can see, so this is just the, so they have them in this little chamber, and they turn on lights, and they monitor the activity, and then the lights go off. Okay, so the lights, dark, darks are the shaded part, all right? And you can see with larval perch, they're active during light, and the zebrafish are active during dark, right? Okay, and then, and then this is just to show you what happens with mercury. So it really shuts down the activity quite a bit. Okay, so what, so what this AOP approach does, if you can start to make these linkages and get it to the cohort survival and duration, are maybe, maybe these behavioral differences don't matter so much, or, or they're really challenging to deal with. So if you can start to, to link it to either gene expression and, and get past it, and then go to the cohort survival or then that would be more powerful. We don't know right now if these behavioral changes are going to be very complicated and hard to, to discern, right? And so this is what you're going to see when you go to any different species. <laughs> They're all going to do slightly different things, right? And so it's something that really makes it challenging. So, so that's why the AOP has also got some sort of attraction to it, because maybe you can, you can skip over these steps that have wide species variation and get to another endpoint that you can converge. But that's, that's one idea. This is some other examples of what they, they do as well. So for example, when they're larval perch swimming speed when they're introduced to food. So, so you have here's a control 
and then they're exposed to mercury right here. So here's a control fish. There, this is their little burst swimming that they do. They, they, they burst around, whereas zebra fish tend to move around a little bit more. These guys just sit there and they burst and burst. That's what that says recording right here. And when you add food, they go crazy. But when you don't, when you're exposed to mercury, you don't do anything. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that's some some examples of things to, to 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 take into consideration. And then spontaneous swimming. So Francisco is amazing. Like he developed all this stuff of, of capturing all this data. So here's a whole bunch of different tracks of of yellow perch in a petri dish, and he's managed to identify each individual. Um, and then what he does is he he gets their average velocity velocity, you know, from some computer programming and stuff like that. So with the control, like we see differences with, here's the um, average swimming speed. And then at point one, it drips down, and then it goes back up at point three, and then <laughs> at one, it goes back down again when they're exposed to mercury. Okay. So basically, this behavior data is being embedded into this individual-based model that we've calibrated for yellow perch, and it's, it's built, and we're just kind of waiting for this data to come in so that we can finish this. Um, to predict population level outcomes, and my PhD student Brandon Armstrong has been working on this. And then we're going to work this behavior data is going to be linked to the neurochemical and receptor data and gene expression, and this is still kind of ongoing. We're still collecting this data. The modelers move a little bit faster, and we have to wait for the. For some reason, these data it takes forever, <laughs> but it, it, it works. It's um, um, but it's good. It's it's we've been we've been the modelers have been really informed in the experimental process the entire way. So. Um, there's been constant communication. Okay. All right. So then the next thing we, we worked in is we have this uh, reproduction AOP right here, um, where, again, I, t I showed you the figure where we have things like uh, plasma sex hormones and vitiligenin, which can link to egg production. And so now we're working in this direction with that one. Um, and so basically I have my basic, what we're doing with this is we have our basic fish vitiligenous model, and we've added this little cap to it um, to, to, to take into consideration all these neurotransmitter dynamics, the GABA, the dopamine, that how it affects the gonadotropin releasing hormone, right? Um, and we've exposed these adults to three doses of mercury, um, 0.5, 5, and 50 parts per million from July to November during their periods of gonadal growth. Um, and we sampled at three time periods and we measured a whole suite of, of steroid levels, follicle stimulating hormones, luteinizing steroid hormones, transcripts, receptor activities, and gene expression. Um, the neurotransmitters that we're adding to this, this model, we have the gamma, uh, the GABA, which, is, uh, which binds to, uh, it, when, when, ga gamma, when GABA binds to the GABA receptors, it stimulates gonadotropin releasing hormone, and it's degraded by this GABA T enzyme. Um, we have dopamine. It binds to the dopamine receptors and it inhibits gonadotropin releasing hormone. It's a key factor that controls sexual maturity and ovulation. And it's degraded by this uh, MOA, MAL. And then we have gonadotropin, um, which is, the loop, is stimulated by gonadotropin releasing hormone. And it contributes to the early stages of gametogenesis. And it promotes te testosterone production. So that's what we've added to the model. So this is my students. Um, sort of, you take your fish, and then, so we have the basic uh, uh, components of the other one. We've just added this, these brain uh, neurotransmitters to it. Um, and he, he, he validated it, so he, he made it look like a perch before it was looked like a croaker, so he's kind of made it look like a, cro uh, a perch using all the data we were collecting. So this is the control um, estradiol, and, and so in September, so there's a little bit of wiggle room here, but we're he was trying to match it to the laboratory um, data that we were collecting. Um, and so while we're still waiting for the gene, uh, gene expression stuff and the neurotransmitter stuff, we, he wanted to try to test out this model using um, published work. So he used the paper from Mill. Um, he looked at pulp and paper mill effluents um, that, uh, that disrupt these, these neurotransmitters. Um, so basically they took paper Paper pulp, and paper pulp and paper mill effluent, and then they extracted it using different solvents to get different types of chemicals out, and then they looked at the, the function of those neurotransmitters in the enzyme, okay? And found that this hexane extracted one seemed to have an effect 
and then also um, this other uh, the water extracted one here on the secondary one. So they fractionated the effluent using the various solvents. They didn't measure specific contaminants per se. Um, they did a secondary effluent, which was treated with activated sludge. Um, the different solvents extracted the different types of contaminants, polar versus nonpolar, hydrophilic versus lipophilic. And then they exposed goldfish brain tissue to these effluent extracts and measured the changes in neurotransmitter receptor binding and enzyme degra degradation. Okay. And so this was the, the main effect. So this is a percent of control, and basically these are all the solvents that they used. Um, so ethyl acetate, you saw there was an increase in dopamine, so some of these were significant. This, this enzyme was decreased, this one was increased. And the hexane, uh, this was, we're circling this one because this one was the most interesting, but we saw all these significant changes um, along the way, and so we, we put all those changes into the model to see what would happen. So basically, you have an increased receptor, you have an increased effect on gonadotropin releasing hormone, it could be either a, a GABA, which is it, uh, stimulatory, or dopamine, which is inhibitory. You could have an increased enzyme, which would be a decreased, decreased effect on the reduction of it. So those were the effects. Um, and so then you run it through the model with all these effects and basically found that all of these different effluent, um, this is the primary effluent and then the secondary effluent. This is on, on GABA release, dopamine release, and the hexane one, seem to have the biggest effect on, on, um, on, uh, on the, the GABA and the dopamine. So basically it re reduced GABA and it increased the, the length of the dopamine. Um, and then this, it, but whereas on the secondary effluent, it didn't seem to have such a major effect on it. Um, and then it, in uh, estradiol, it seemed to really affect the estradiol dynamics. For example, the hexane um, extracted one, whereas the other ones did not seem to have that much of an effect. Um, and then on vitilogenin production, the hexane one really cut down the cumulative vitilogenin that was being produced. Okay. So then you can sort of do some loose math <laughs> and relate this to egg production. Um, and basically, I mean, this is, this is proof of principle. Don't, don't quote us on this. It's not real. <laughs> but just to sort of demonstrate how this might work, and so you can see that the hexane might have, you might have this huge reduction in fecundity on that hexane extracted um, um, part of the effluent, right? Whereas um, the other ones did not seem to have any effect on the final egg production, okay? Um, so that nonpolar hexane derived, we don't know what the contaminant is located in there, but it may cause significant reduced vitilogenin production, and then if you treat the effluent with the activated sludge, it seems to remove those effects somehow, okay? So that's kind of how we're thinking of moving with this. So what are we gonna do then is we're still ground truthing the model. We wanna measure vitilogenin transcripts from the liver and blood concentration so we get better validation. And then we're gonna use our mercury data derived from the yellow perch study. Um, but we're also taking this and moving it to birds and mammals as well. Um, and that's because it's a result of this, this grant that I'm on with Neil Basu and so I, after, I got some slides from him um, to, to present here. Um, so we're, I'm on this grant with him. We're development of a cell-free neurochemical screening battery to predict adverse outcomes in mammals, fish, and birds. So it's building off these types of models, um, but using the ToxCast data, the ToxCast approach to things, where in the EPA launched, launched the ToxCast in 2007 to predict ways to predict potential toxicity and develop cost-effective approaches for prior prioritizing those thousands of chemicals. Um, basically using these tools to predict how the human body processes are impacted by these exposures. And it includes over 650 state-of-the-art high-throughput rapid tests, okay? So basically that's what's included in there. And they're screening thousands of environmental chemicals for potential toxicity. Um, and so this is just an example of some of the papers that are coming out of, that are using this ToxCast system here. Um, so, for example, this just came out, I think, in 2013, um, if, you're, if you're interested. But what's the most important thing is here, the cell-free high-throughput assays are the most, of the most of the assays that are being used in this podcast to predict. And this is, but this is based on human health. So this is ToxCast. How do we move this ToxCast to eco-ToxCast? Okay, they're based on cell lines from humans and things like that. So the ToxCast is based on human cell lines, but how do we move it to like thousands of fish mammals and birds, <laughs> right? Um, 
There's a few model bioassay organisms per ta taxa. What about the thousands of others? There's a lot of interspecies variations. What about the rare and at-risk species as well? Um, and there's a lot of concerns over using huge whole animal bioassays. Um, uh, societal, um, as Valerie mentioned, it's going to get increasingly difficult. And then also it's really expensive to do some of these things on whole animals. And so, um, so as a result of this, I mean, the, the tox cast for the human is getting better, but the in vitro tools for tox ecotox are, are limited. And so, um, so, so Nils going out and he, he's going out and he's getting brain tissue from all sorts of organisms. Five minutes, okay. He's obtaining the brain tissue, isolating the cellular components. He's going to characterize receptor transport enzymes in the absence or presence of toxicants and calculate the IC50 and model output. You can put these all in a 96 wall plate. <laughs> all right. It, it assesses these simpler interactions, although perhaps it, it is an oversimplification. It, you can choose biochemicals that are in these in a pathway based manner. So you can choose the ones that are relevant to your particular. AOP. Right. Um, you can get quantitative outputs and some biological understanding to enable the data to predict adverse effects. It's quick, relatively cheap, and generates hypothesis. Because it's based on plates, you can get some high throughput screening. It's one of the USDC TOXCAST, and it's really available. You can use it for any organism, and, and there's a lot of literature that's based on this. So basically, you have 3,000 pollutants. 30,000 pollutants that you have to test. A lot of them will um, be neurotoxic, so they'll affect things like reproduction and neural behavior. So what it's doing is he's, we're incorporating the brain chemistry, so things like uh, dopamine, gamma, uh, dopamine um, GABA, and uh, glutamate, and cholinergic uh, system here. Okay. So basically we want to advance this in vitro cell free neurochemical screening assay platform to mammals, fish, and birds to predict adverse effects. And a hypothesis is that several toxicants are going to emerge that interact and disrupt the function of the neurotransmitter receptor, receptors, enzymes, and transporters that mediate vertebrate reproduction. So basically, kind of what he's doing, he's got 20 different species where he has brain tissue from. Um, we're looking at 80 to 100 chemicals. I'm looking at 16 different endpoints. So we have all these data points that are coming out of this. Um, so th we have a number of these neurochemical assays, so things that work with acetylcholine, dopamine, GABA, glutamate. There's a number of different fish and different, different species. There's uh, freshwater fish, marine ducks, birds, uh, marine mammals, uh, and some humans as well. And then he's looking at all these hundreds of chemicals on this, on this platform you know, metals, pharmaceuticals, PAHs, pesticides. Um, and then basically, so what he's doing, he's getting all this receptor function um, and how it, all that receptor enzymes and functions and how that influences gonadotropin. And then we're taking it and adding it to our fish model and then also building a bird model and the mammal model as well to incorporate them and to try to predict what the egg production will be. So, um, so obviously the AOPs, there's a lot of gaps, <laughs> all right? There's a lot of work to do, but what I, what's really interesting about the AOPs is that many people see how their work fits into it, okay? So a lot of biologists, not necessarily just toxicologists, but stressor biologists, even just regular biologists, see, oh, I can, I can fit in here. I do this little part. Um, maybe I can link it to a higher level biological organization, okay? As a result of this, this AOP approach, um, it's developing this community of people that are kind of working together and building this framework. Um, it's, it's very simple right now because it has to be, I think, to get people involved in it and so it makes it more tractable. Um, but it might change. It's probably going to change and as peop more and more people get involved in it, it's going to change probably over time. Right? Now, how do we link this AOP to community levels and higher? That, that's something which would be worth discussion here. Um, and really, we need a lot of more quantitative linkages between these key events that are absent. But anyway, so I probably talked enough and some of those funding sources, and I thank you for your time. <laughs>